Hi everyone! Welcome to Journey of the Unordinary, a podcast where we will carry out intimate conversations with our guests to learn about their journeys to where they are today. In each episode, we'll cover where they grew up, what are some pivotal moments in their life, and their approach in life in general. I'm Jackie, a Chinese-born New York City living girl who is perpetually on a hunt for her childhood hometown food from Kunming. And I'm Chuxing, a Chinese-born Sydney living girl who loves exploring life and making meaningful connections. In this season, we bring you ten episodes of ten guests centered around tech and data. Join us to uncover their unique parts of these beautiful, unordinary people. Find a piece of yourself in their stories, and let their adventure inspire you. Hey everyone, welcome to the third episode of Journey of the Unordinary. Today we have our very special guest, Kofi. Kofi is one of the OG、uh, Web three data nerd, and we are really happy to have him here with us today. Yay! Yeah, happy to be here. So we met Kofi, I think, just through the grapevine of Doom Wizards. Before we dive into the conversation,、um, Kofi, can you briefly introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, no problem.、Um, yeah, my name is Kofi. I am from Ghana, but、uh, right now I spend most of the year between the UK and Ghana.、Uh, like they were saying, I'm a big、uh, on-chain data nerd. I've been in crypto since 2017. And yeah, right now I'm just、uh, having a good time helping different people out with their on-chain data problems. You grew up in Ghana. Maybe can you tell us a little bit more about you, your growing up experience as a child in Ghana? Yeah, sure. I mean, I、um, I was actually so I was born in the UK、uh, because my parents like went to university here and then worked here for a bit, and then we moved back to Ghana when I was three years old. So I don't remember any of the part before that. Um, but yeah, I mean that's where I spent pretty much all of my、uh, childhood, and it's great. It's thirty degrees all year round. You know, it's、uh, the food's better than anywhere else in the world.、Uh, you know, we've got our problems. Like, you know, we're not really great when it comes to、uh, corruption and all of that. But yeah, Ghana's a great place.、Um, and I was applying for universities abroad simply because. I don't know. We have some good universities at home, but if you want to study、um, engineering, which is what I ended up doing, there are better places to go. So I applied to U.S. universities. Realized that they were way too expensive. I don't understand how anybody affords that. And then、uh, applied to UK universities instead, and ended up uh, um, coming to the UK to go to university in Edinburgh in Scotland.、Um, so I moved to the UK in 2015. Um, did my degree, masters, and everything. Finished in twenty twenty, and then I moved to London. And I've been in London for、um, two, three years now. So before you moved to um, UK, um, like, did you did you find like a good uh, 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 maybe like a cultural difference when you moved from Ghana to to UK?、Uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of differences. I mean, I feel like it also depends on what part of the UK you're in,、um, because in London, for instance, people are very.、Uh, there's like more of a hectic energy here. Like everybody's in a rush to get somewhere and all of that. I feel like Ghanaians are more laid back,、um, and sometimes that's a problem. Like we're too laid back about things that we shouldn't be laid back about. Like、uh, every event back home starts two, three hours late, and like、uh, that kind of thing.、Um, but you know. This is you know that's London. Edinburgh was different. Edinburgh, I think, had、um, a more chill energy that I liked. It was like a very easy place to live,、um, even compared to being at home. Like everything just like works. It's clean. It's organized. People are nice.、Um, but you only get three sunny days a year, so you know you win some, you lose some, right?、Um, but yeah. I I feel like when it comes to cultural differences, there were cultural differences, but nothing that I was that surprised by because I mean, just by virtue of being in the world, everybody's watched UK, US movies, television since they were a kid. So I mean, you know,、uh, you like yeah. If you have access to the internet, you never run into anything that you're surprised by. I kind of feel. 
Um, and it was great, you know, going to a new place, be a new person. Maybe like share with us, because precisely to your point, I think there's a proliferation of content about US UK, but like a lot less, let's say about Ghana. So maybe share with us something that people would be surprised to know about Ghana, where they、mm, get it wrong all the time. Yeah, things that people might get wrong about Ghana. I mean, I think that it's hard because. I feel compared to other some other、uh, African countries, like I feel like a lot more people know about Nigeria or about South Africa or something like that compared to Ghana.、Um, we kind of are very similar to Nigerians in a lot of ways, but、uh, I feel like on the global stage, we almost kind of live in Nigeria's shadow a little bit. Like we have similar food, listen to similar music,、um, although we're always arguing about all of those things online.、Um, I think that people might not realize that、uh, Ghana is really, I feel, in a lot of ways, the the place. I feel like Ghana is the the good beginner level West Africa country to go to, you know,、um, because I mean, it's kind of. Peaceful, laid back. The people are nice. It's not as hectic as、uh, Nigeria, which a lot more people would kind of have heard of and、uh, been familiar with. And、uh, yeah, with some,、um, what's the word? I think that yeah, kind of. If you are going to go to any West African country first, I think that Ghana is the easiest to get to and the easiest to kind of、uh, experience and like explore and all of that. Um, but、mm. yeah, it's not it's not on as many folks' radar, I think. Yeah, I have、um, I have a follow up question because、um, like you, me, and Jackie, we all kind of lived in one country before, and now we move to somewhere else.、Um, is there one part of Ghana or maybe one part of Africa that you bring with you to UK while you're living in UK? Is there is there like something that You feel like is still making me more attached to the country where I'm from instead of b- being in the UK. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a tough one because it's like a a whole like mix part of identity stuff, right? Like,、um, you know, I, for instance, don't understand people who. Live in the UK and like think that a、uh, the a hot chili Dorito is like considered spicy,、um, and like I listen to Afrobeats all the time and、um, my I sometimes like have dreams about food from back home like while I'm sitting here in this freezing country,、uh, yeah it's just like、um, a million different things right. A million like small things、um, that you take with you or that shape you and all of that, and then that affects how you see the rest of the world.、Um, yeah, I mean, what about you guys? Because you have like, yeah, like you were saying, you've got like a similar type of experience. Oh yeah,、uh, I can talk about myself very briefly, and Jackie can totally talk about herself as well. But I think I still listen to a lot of Chinese、yeah. music. Even though I also get like listen to a bunch of other music as well, and then I also still I think I find myself reading Chinese books still much faster than reading English books, depending on the context. And then also I find it easily relatable to people who come from China. But I also see that oh there are certain things that because I spend a lot of time here in Australia, so I find it like very natural to me. Like oh for example like coffee drinking culture is a very Australian thing, and also um. Drinking alcohol, but I I don't do that.、Um, so, but that's also a super Australian thing,、um, apparently. And also going to the beach, enjoy the sunshine is very stereotypical and laid back. So, sort of is is a mix of both, and that makes me and everyone else who have mixed cultural kind of experience unique.、Um, yeah, so that's my personal experience. Jackie, 
Yeah, I I love how you just flipped the table on us. Um, <laughs> I know. Yeah, and like I totally echo with the identity part. I I think at this point I've spent half of my life in China and half my life in the U.S. And I don't fully like identity wise. I don't really know. I I don't fully identify with either. Um, so it's really weird. But I guess by that extension, I get so excited every time I meet somebody with similar like background and culture, which is why when I first saw Chu Xi on <laughs> Discord, I'm like, I need to know this girl. <laughs> she's in crypto. She's Chinese, um, and then she's also like similar, like from like from China, but like living in the Western world. Um, so identity wise, I definitely yeah. feel like kind of like split and like totally about the food i have to like one of the main reason i moved to new york city is food like i need my chinese food yeah i I I totally relate to what you guys are talking about because um i feel like music is a huge thing like you were saying and um there is something special about meeting somebody who's also got that weird half between like background where like you grew up somewhere and you've got like strong roots there but then Maybe you had your coming of age or like, you know, transition to adulthood somewhere else mm. and like, you know, adopted all of these different things. And it's hard to um, it's hard to explain that to people who don't have that uh, background. It's, you know, the experiences is, is so unique. And I mean, Jackie, you said something that like I think resonated a lot in that when you when you live um, uh, in that sort of way, you end up being in a bit of a limbo because when I go back home now, I'm not as Ghanaian as I was when I was a kid because I've been away for a few years now, like maybe a bit too long. Um, and that like shows up in a lot of different ways. Like I don't maybe get like what the latest joke is and like my um, local language is not as strong as it was when I was younger and all of this sort of stuff. But I'm obviously also definitely not British. Like infinitely far like i would never <laughs> consider myself to be british um uh, yeah they've also got like, a huge drinking culture here too which was that was one of the cultural differences for sure um especially because i moved to scotland and the scottish yeah. are like even worse than the british you know they've actually got a law in scotland oh. you can't buy alcohol from grocery stores after 10 p.m because they were just like, if we just let these guys buy alcohol whenever they want, this country will fall apart because they, they're like genetically programmed <laughs> to be alcoholics. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Oh it's, my it's, God. It's, yeah. Wait, um, different languages in Ghana? Because I feel like in a lot of African countries, like you've got your own tribe and there's like the standard one. Yeah. Like, was it the same? Yeah, Ghana? for sure. I mean, I think that there are, I don't know, maybe 11 plus languages or something in Ghana. Most people um, speak uh tree or ga or ewe and like you were saying it's a tribal thing so i'm um i'm a khan that's my tribe and you know i can people uh, a lot of Akan people speak tree so that would be my uh my local language and yeah you said a khan or a khan so a-k-a-n a khan a-k-a-n wow okay does that mean something in that language or no, it's just the name? a name i mean maybe it does maybe there is some like I don't know, like uh, <laughs> linguistic, like root there, but I don't know enough uh, to say that. It's just the name. Um, but yeah, I feel like you get that um, kind of mix of a lot of different languages and stuff in a lot of African countries because, I mean, when the British or the French or the Portuguese or whoever, like, you know, were drawing your borders, they just kind of, uh, yeah, it was, they kind of like made decisions based on like, I guess we own this piece of land now. Um, without really much consideration to like um, which tribe is where. So you get like um, a bunch of different countries that have a bunch of different cultural groups and people who maybe in pre-colonial era were very separate and very different, but have now been like grouped into one country. And then after, you know, post-colonization, have to figure out how to be like a, a single country or a single like group together, right? And is Ghana, like, French or British? Like, did you speak English yeah, as a kid? Yeah, so Ghana was colonized by the British, so everybody uh, everybody back home mm. speaks English. But we're surrounded by um, Francophone countries because we're right next to, uh, like, uh, Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire, and, um, you know, some, yeah, Togo, uh, other, like, French-speaking parts. But, 
yeah, Ghanaians speak English. Speaking of that, um, what did you want to grow up as? Like when Kovi was younger, what what would you like to become? Yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, I I wanted to be a scientist when I grew up, but I didn't really know what a scientist was. So I think actually I would have told people I wanted to be a scientist, but I really wanted to be was an engineer because uh, I don't know, I'd watch mm. too much Dexter's lab and stuff. And I thought that like, yeah, you know, want to grow up and make robots or like spinny, floaty, shiny things, something along those lines. Uh, but yeah, that was the thing. And that's why you study that pretty young. And that, that was why you study. And that was why you study engineering, yeah. right? Um, although it's kind of funny because considering what I wanted to do when I was a kid, I probably it would have made more sense to study mechanical engineering. But I studied civil engineering mm-hmm. um, simply because it was like, uh, oh, yeah, you know, as a kid, I wanted to make robots and things. But people in Ghana don't make robots. But we've got a lot of bad roads and bridges and like the power goes out a lot. So I was just like civil engineering makes more sense because like it's the type of engineering that people actually need uh, here. So I decided to study that. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's how I randomly fell into that which is like funny because i don't do any civil engineering like if if somebody told me to i don't know design a bridge or something right now everybody on the bridge would it would be like a huge casualty um i don't remember anything from my degree um it was still great to do though i met a lot of great people but i absolutely remember zero content from Mm. the yeah the supposed master's degree that i'm supposed to have so what was the trajectory like when you moved from the civil engineering degree? I remember you you mentioned that previously you did some machine learning as well. And then you became a VC. And now you're doing all this like data nurse stuff. But what, what is the transition like when you transition from um, civil engineering to something else? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know if it could be considered a transition. It was just like a lot of messy... I was just trying out a lot of different stuff while I was doing my degree. So um, I started studying in 2015. And then, uh, you know, 2017 was when I first got introduced to crypto because I was living with some friends who, like, I don't know, they like read some stuff on the internet and then decided to spend a bunch of their student loan money on graphics cards so that they could start mining Ethereum out of the flat. So I just came home one day and like uh, my friends, uh, Brandon and Craig, they were just putting together these uh, PCs. And I didn't even really understand the crypto part of it. I was just like, oh, putting together computers is cool. I want to learn how to put together computers. So I was interested in that. Um, And they like made some money and then in 2017 and the money evaporated in 2018, like most people's experience around the time, uh, right? And that was um, interesting. But then 2018, 2019 was when I learned how to, uh, was when I learned how to code because some other friends um, who I knew, uh, we did the, um, SpaceX used to do this Hyperloop student competition. And so we did that in 2018 and 2019. And, you know, we got to go to the finals and go to California and visit the rocket factory and all that. Um, And we were making these um, Hyperloop pod prototypes. It's like a little, like a maglev train that you shoot through a a, a vacuum tube. And I was in charge. I ended up somehow, for some reason, being in charge of software for that. Not because I was a good software engineer on the team. Like everybody else who knew how to code on the team was much better than I was. But nobody wanted to do the managerial stuff. So like I like moved from like working on um some remote control stuff for our prototype to just being in in charge of that team and that was how i learned how to code uh which randomly meant that like moving forward like when i had internships and stuff uh doing uni i would be the guy in the office who knew how to code and so i would get the code related work um which is you know then why when i was finally doing my dissertation by that point I feel like I pretty much decided that I wasn't really maybe going to be and do a normal civil engineering thing. Um, and I knew how to code, so I did a machine learning dissertation. It was like a computer vision project around, um, you know, 
basically how can you take photos and images and like make 3D models of buildings out of those. I was very specifically focusing on a very, very niche part of that topic around like how to automatically detect electrical stuff in interior spaces like switches and radiators and things. Um, so that, I did that for my dissertation and I stayed on um, for like, I don't know, about a year or so uh, working as a research assistant um, at the university after that and um, managed to get um, a paper published on my on my work, like just like the most niche of niche things, like computer vision, object detection for um, MEP components in the interior spaces using 3D images, some niche bullshit like that. And it was really fun. It was a great time. It sounds fancy. Yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting, but you know, they don't pay academics enough to live. So you need to move on and like find, um, you know, an actual job to do. Um, maybe in some parallel universe where academics actually got paid, I would still be doing that. Um, but yeah, I got, um, a transport planning job, uh, because, you know, I had some transport planning internships and I was, that was what I moved down to London for. I moved down to London for a transport planning job where I was doing like railway timetable optimization type things, um, or like road design type things uh and you know in that i was like using some of the coding data science stuff that i knew how to do but then it was for transport uh and it was in 2020 that i started getting involved in crypto again just because like i saw a lot of people spending a bunch of money on nfts right and i was just like oh that's that's weird and like interesting and stuff um and uh i started figuring out how to um do some data analysis around that because i mean i didn't have any money as a graduate transport planner but like i knew how to do data things so i was just like hey i can be involved that way um trying to like scrape data from nifty gateway or like do stuff like that to figure out how uh things worked and then eventually discovering dune right which i use a lot now um and yeah I was doing the normal job in evenings and weekends, trying to figure out crypto data stuff and writing about it on Reddit, which was stupid because, you know, Reddit is like, you know, if you have some post that goes viral on Reddit, it doesn't like help you in the long run. Like people don't follow people on Reddit. Um, so I was just like, oh, this is dumb. I should start using something like Twitter where, you know, if you post something great, people follow you and that like, it, you know, it's useful, it compounds over time uh, and started writing a news newsletter as well, um, initially just about NFT market data stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it's a long story. It wasn't like uh, I was doing normal engineering one day and then I was doing crypto data another day. I was just doing a bunch of random different stuff uh, and then like ended up, yeah, uh, doing crypto data. Posting on Reddit, like, I think that's a first. I have not heard crypto people posting on Reddit before. Yeah, man. Uh, but to your point, maybe that's yeah, why. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Because the thing is that um, I didn't have a Twitter account in 2020. Mm. I didn't even really, I was like a, tangentially aware of Twitter, but I'd never been on Twitter. And so like, uh, oh. I don't yeah. know, searching for NFT stuff on the internet, like at the time, like, NFTs were kind of becoming popular on Reddit um, and all of that. And so I would um, do some analysis of like, oh, here are, you know, I made a data set of artists who like made a 10K of sales in the past month. And he was, here was some trends or whatever. And I'd post that on Reddit and it would get like 600 upvotes. Um, but then it would be like, Wow. Yeah, it would, you know, I had like one or two posts that did well on Reddit. But the thing is that, again, I realized that it was dumb because, yeah, maybe you'd post something that would do well on Reddit and then you'd post something that nobody read. Uh, but you didn't like collect any value from that. Like you don't like, become, mm. uh, you, it's not like with, uh, I feel like compared to Twitter, it's harder to, get to know people and like build a community and have people kind of 
um, get to recognize you as an individual because it's just about like, oh, people are just scrolling mm -hmm. in the subreddit. They're not like there for you specifically. Yeah. They're there for the subreddit. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. 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 Just going back, you were talking about how you decided to not do perhaps mechanical engineering, but civil engineering because you wanted to help your home country. I feel like that's so wholesome. Like you, you wanted, you had like a, a goal to, to study something and help your home country. Um, so moving that into the crypto world, um, obviously you were like spending your extra time at night to do crypto things. So what were some of the motivation that made you like so interested in uh, data science and crypto as you kind of found your way from, I guess, transplant, tra tra trans transport planning <laughs> to, uh, to eventually now? Yeah, um, motivations. Motivation is a weird thing because I didn't really have like a, um, a good motivation at the time. Like I feel like there was some 50-50 mix of 50% fear of missing out, right? Because uh, in 2017, 2018, like I like watched my friends like start this like, you know, profitable mining farm thing. But like, you know, I could have put some money into that and gotten involved, but like I was too risk averse, too afraid. And so like I helped put together some computers, but like had no uh, kind of financial upside in that. And it's not that they got super rich or anything they made enough to buy like a really really shitty car uh and then they like <laughs> drove that uh, uh uh they drove it from the uk to uzbekistan and back <laughs> so that's a little bit of money oh wow yeah. that was, was a really good trip wow. i was just like you know they had this this awesome experience that i only was got to be tangentially involved and i was like yeah this is obviously like it made perfect sense to me that like oh, blockchains can be used for all of this financial stuff. And if you have NFTs, then it's like it extends the use cases to like all of this stuff that isn't um, financial. Now, you know, that was like, this is awesome. It's going to be like huge. And I wanted to be involved somehow because, um, yeah, I just didn't want to miss out. Um, and then, you know, so there's 50% for more and 50% of just... Um, you know, having a shiny new toy to play with, right? Like, it's like, oh, this is just like a new cool thing um, to learn about because I have kind of shiny toy syndrome. And I went to university for pretty much knowing, but I spent most of my time in university focusing on stuff that had nothing to do with my degree. Like I was telling you about the, um, the Hyperloop stuff or like, you know, doing, trying to learn about uh, machine learning or whatever so yeah i was just like this is just a new like shiny toy on the internet to play with uh and that, that was my motivation um because i didn't have any plans at the time of like doing crypto data full time it was just like a thing i was doing evenings and weekends um and then uh yeah i started posting on Twitter and started doing this newsletter, like maybe I thought like it would end up becoming like a, maybe a side hustle type thing. Like oh, I could make some extra money or something on the side doing crypto data stuff. I was helping like one or two people out with tiny projects, like, oh, some NFT project wants a Dune dashboard, I'd help them out with that. Um, but then Richard Chen, who ended up uh, becoming my, my boss eventually, um, I... Yeah, just kind of knew him because there aren't that many people who like were super active on, on Dune on a regular basis, like 20, 2020, early 2021. Um, so because I knew Richard, when he and uh, Nick at One Confirmation, which is this early stage crypto VC fund, when they were looking for a third person to join the team, uh, yeah, he messaged me and he was like, you know, do you want to come and do this instead? And like quit this transfer planning thing and come and do uh, VC, which I actually, I think the first time that we talked about it, I said I didn't want to do it because I had like a, a sort of a life plan in mind. Like I was going to become a, a chartered, get my chartered transfer planning certification or something in five years. And then like, you know, uh, I don't know, be like qualified and have a normal career or something like that. But um, 
yeah, by the second time, something, something like, like that. that. A normal career. Yeah. Well, then the second time he asked me later that year, I was like, yeah, actually, at this point, I'm spending more of my time on my what is supposed to be the evening weekend stuff than I am on my actual job, which is not sustainable. It doesn't really make sense. So uh, and that's when I went made the jump into working in crypto full time. Um, and like, yeah, kudos to Richard, because I, I was not... I, I was not qualified for that job. That job was much better of an opportunity than I deserved. I don't really fully understand what they were thinking there, but um, yeah, it's a great opportunity for sure. Yeah, so it was it was never on top of your mind that you would ever become a VC, right? Back then, when Richard offered you the job, did you even know what this would what tell? No, <laughs> I don't really like until I until I met Richard. I, did I did I know what VCs did? I feel like I, I I'm I'm fairly sure I knew almost nothing. Like maybe on some podcast or other, I'd heard of the concept of companies fundraising, but I had no idea what a venture capital firm did. I had no clue whatsoever. Mm. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of learning and introduction stuff. For me to do i mean even at that point like most of the you know on-chain data analysis stuff that i'd done had been like around nft so not even like some other cat i i barely knew anything about like you know say DeFi or i don't know layer twos or anything like that um so there was a lot of stuff i had to figure out um which is again why uh yeah there's a better opportunity than probably it made sense to give me but yeah, they took a chance, uh, yeah. which was awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm also very fascinated by how you entered, say, in crypto, not really knowing anything and now become like one of the most knowledgeable like on-chain data nerd. And also you started doing this VC job without really knowing what VC is doing back then. And people might wonder like, hey, Kofi, do you have any superpower or I don't know, some magic that you just started learning all these things super quickly and become knowledgeable in that space? Like what, what is that superpower like? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that there's um, a particular superpower. It's more just, um, I think I was able to learn a lot of stuff really quickly simply because I was just doing I was making progress every week and I was interested in it um it's really hard to like if you're going to learn something or like figure something out or compete with somebody it's really hard to compete with somebody who just like is genuinely interested in something as in I think that I was waking up every single day like the only thing I was thinking about was crypto the only thing that I was reading that about was crypto the only thing that like I did on the weekends and the evenings and in spare time was crypto. So, I mean, if you're, if you're that deep in the rabbit hole, you're going to make progress a lot faster than somebody who's only like putting in a normal amount of time and effort and like mind space. Um, but yeah, I think that in, in general, um, really, I just got lucky with a lot of stuff. And the way that you get lucky is by doing more things um so i you know i got lucky when it came to um getting to meet a lot of great people in like the on-chain data nerd the world um simply because like i didn't know what i was doing but like every single week i was like hey i'll, I'll figure out a new I have some question about what's going on with the, uh, you know, in Ethereum or in NFTs or whatever, and I'll figure out how to answer that question with data analysis and I'll post about it online so that people who have the same question, like, could get the answer. And, like, um, it's also, like, builds up some trust because they're like, hey, every week this guy is coming back and he's got some new information. Like, he must know what he's talking about. I had no idea what I was talking about. But, like, you know... Every single like week, like without fail, I was like, I'm going to learn at least one new thing. And um, yeah, I think that that's really what it comes down to. Just like uh, not being afraid of like uh, being embarrassed and like, uh, you know, just kind of being obsessed with something and doing a bunch of 
random stuff. Like you don't, you know, I still don't know what I'm doing generally in life, but I do a lot of stuff. And when you do a lot of things, it like creates more opportunities for luck to happen to you, right? Because, you know, luck doesn't really happen if you're just like sitting around waiting for um, some opportunity to show up. I guess if you had a teenager asking you for advice on how to find that interest that you were describing, um, how would you, what advice would you give them? Yeah. Um, what kind of advice would I give to a teenager? I mean, I think that like, it really comes down to the, um, uh, having a high volume of, of doing things. I feel people always like cite, I don't know what is this was some Harvard or Stanford study or something about a pottery class where, um, one sample group was asked to make as many pots as possible. And one sample group was asked to make the best possible pot that they could do. And um, in the end, the folk who all the, all they were told to do was make more pots, like had like much more like high quality pots than folk who were just focusing on trying to make one perfect one. So, I mean, if you just do a lot of things and you go all in on them, it will probably be fine. I think over the course of my, degree like doing my degree and then my master's over five years i like changed what i thought my thing was six times like when i started i thought my degree i thought like um oh i thought i was going to be like a social entrepreneur and i was doing a lot of like social entrepreneurship society stuff because i thought that that was cool and then i thought i was going to do a graphic design agency and i tried to do a graphic design agency that failed miserably i was like going around like trying to sell logos and brochure design and stuff to local businesses that made absolutely no money for a year doing that um and then i was like uh oh yeah elon musk has told me hyperloop is the future so let me do that and i spent another <laughs> two years of my life on that and then i spent two years of my life on um on uh on machine learning and so really it's just um it's fine to not know what it is that you want to do you just have to pick something to start and then like, you know, give it a year, two years and like, you know, yeah, just do the best you can. And then you'll have more information to, you know, to pick a new thing and then try that. And then you have more information to pick a new thing and then try that. And some of the things that you skills that you got before will be transferable. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that that's um, really the only advice that's useful because there's all of this like, I guess, tactical advice of like, oh, you know, in this situation, do this. But the only thing that I think like applies generally is that like people should just, you know, you should just do a lot of stuff. You should just pick things and just uh, try and, uh, you know, go all in and make progress. And, uh, you know, that's how you learn enough to get the wisdom of, um, you know, discerning like what is the right thing for you. Kofi, I find I find it relatable because I think especially when people are younger, they they don't really know what they want. And if you explore very broadly, you probably find something. And it's yeah, just pretty much like don't stay complacent. Um, but also at the same time, on the opposite side, like do you think you're gonna continue doing this as you grow older? Because especially when you've accumulated, I don't know, your reputation, the knowledge in the space, and then if you're gonna start something new the opportunity cost is actually quite high, especially when people are getting older. So do you think that's going to be something that you're going to hold up to even when you're turning, I don't know, 30, 40 or whatever? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm definitely not going to change as much. Um, I think that the thing that's good about doing, trying out 10 different things, not at the same time, like one at a time, like I don't know, in your early <laughs> teen, teens and then early 20s and all of that is that um, you basically just get a lot of data points on the graph to kind of be like, oh, I can start to see the trend of like what it is I'm actually good at and what I actually like doing. So um, like in my teens and then uh early 20s i got a lot of data points trying out very different things that kind of pointed me towards yeah i mean i know that generally I, I want to do a technical thing right and i know that generally like the data science side of things is maybe what i'm most 
interested in what I'm best at when it comes to technical stuff. So I know that I'm probably not going to change there. And then I was, you know, trying out a bunch of different fields and um, I landed um, in crypto, which I feel I'm not going to like, I'm not going to leave crypto and do some other uh, field of things because I figured out um, like based on trying a bunch of different stuff that, hey, I tried some stuff. And I didn't like that as much, but I really like what I'm doing now. Um, and I know that this is the right thing for me because I've had those past experiences. So I know that I know what bad looks like and I know what good looks like. And I can appreciate when I found something that's better than good. Um, which like, yeah, I don't know. Also weirdly, tangentially, I think is a good strategy for dating. I think like going a bunch of, uh, yeah, going on a bunch of dates and like, having some relationships early on so that you know what you like and you don't like. And when you find something that you like more than normal, you actually have the, the data set to know that like, oh, this is like abnormally good. You should probably hold on to that type vibes. Uh, have, you, have you heard the, like something about you date like six people or five people or something like at this mathematical equation? And then let's say it's like first five people and then you just date and then the sixth people or like the seventh person, you just, if it's like better than the previous, then you should just. I feel like person. that makes sense. I, I feel know. like that would be a thing. Cause yeah, after, you know, after <laughs> like five, six people or something, you, I mean, know, assuming that they're pretty different people and you've kind of gathered some information and then you would kind of know that the next person that you meet that is better than all of the people you've met before in terms of like being compatible with you, you should probably just stay with that person. I mean, I feel like the statistics, I'm not good at math, but like, I feel like the statistics would probably line up there if somebody actually, um, yeah, did some analysis on that. I, I, I wanted to like circle back to the previous topic. Um, it, feels like in your talking you're quite free you your spirit is quite free to kind of go chase after these things um i wonder do, do you feel like your upbringing like your parents how they approach life like enabled you to yeah not really i feel like i had a very uh, i was not very ad adventurous or like very free or anything along those lines um as a kid i was a very introverted kid i um i think that like eight-year-old me or something's only interest was um i just want to read books everybody should leave me alone you know type vibes um and i think that uh it was more that i just had to unlearn a lot of like um you know uh, uh kind of uh fears and stuff like that um i mean one thing that was really good is that my last four years of high school, I went to a boarding school, which was pretty great because, um, you know, uh, it gave me the opportunity to try and like break out of my shell a little bit because I wasn't living at home for the first time. It's just like, oh, you, you move to this new place and you're kind of living close to friends and all of that. And um, you have to do these um, hard and different things. Um, and then moving to university like was like a huge change because it's just like, oh, I'm moving to a new country by myself. And what's amazing is that nobody here has any idea who I am or like what I'm supposed to be like. So I can be like a, um, a totally a new person here. And if I do something wrong outside, like, you know, the people in my, like my family and friends from whom I'm not going to hear about it if I fall down and make some ridiculous mistake here. So this, you know. Uh, the risks felt very low to kind of um, be more like out there and free and all that. But no, I think that like when I had like a pretty normal upbringing in the sense that like most people, uh, I was pretty af afraid of trying new things and like pretty like averse to like making a mistake or dropping the ball somewhere because you're trained that like oh what you're supposed to do is to try and get the um highest score possible always on on tests or whatever uh you know and I, I was like trying to be good at school and do all those after school lessons and everything like that and um you know that sort of mentality is very averse to exploring things because if you're exploring new things you're by definition going to be shit at first 
but you're, you've been trained from a young age to never be shit at things. Like you always should, uh, yeah, be trying to uh, get A's or something like that. Like failure was uh, indoctrinated as being like the worst possible scenario. Whereas it's like in life, yeah, if you want to try new stuff, like failure has to become normal. Like it has to, you have to, even if you're like learning how to write code, you have to be accustomed to the fact that the first seven times you try and write something is just not going to work. And then eventually it works. And you don't know why, but it works. So you're not going to change it now. <laughs> you don't know why it yeah, works. Yeah, no clue. Um, so, yeah, I think that there was a lot of um, stuff I just had to uh, unlearn, you know. Yeah. Did, did you think you turned into a new person when you moved to UK? Because you, what you said just now is exactly what I thought to myself when I first moved to Australia, like, oh, nobody knew that I was a super introverted kid and I'm going to change to a completely different person. And it turned out that eventually I, I'm, I'm still who I am, but maybe like a little bit better than before. But, but just based on what you were saying, did you, did you, did you change to a completely different new person? Yeah, for sure. I think I definitely did become a, a whole new person when I moved um, to the UK. Um, yeah, because it was just, an opportunity it's kind of like i feel like when you're at home um you kind of get trapped in the cage of other people's expectations of you like you surrounded by people who've known you since you were two three years old or something like that and they have all of these ideas of like oh this is how kofi is or how jackie is or shushin is and how they're supposed to be and what they're like and you go to a new place and nobody has any expectations of you they don't know anything about you so you could just decide to like set all sorts of new expectations um and yeah it was great because it was like this was i was going as far as i could possibly go from being at home i didn't even know that edinburgh was in scotland when i applied to university all i knew was that i'm going to the <laughs> uk um and so yeah i uh I, I i think that that definitely uh was kind of opening the floodgates sort of to do new stuff and be a new me and all of that. Um, can I circle back to the dating oh, yeah. idea? Go ahead. What is your uh, ideal when it comes to finding a life partner, like qualities or I don't know, things, because we were talking about the mathematical approach, but I'm, I'm curious about the uh, the qualitative approach <laughs> in your mind. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that like I... I'm pretty, uh, I, I'm pretty basic when it comes to that. No real hot takes in terms of like, you're just kind of thinking about somebody who has, um, first of all, like kind of matches your values in terms of like, what are their priorities and what do they think is important in life? And does that like match up with yours? Um, and then, uh, yeah, have, you know, obviously like having some uh, shared interests and I feel like um, it's an interesting thing because it's definitely easier to do that. I feel if somebody has a similar background to you, um, although that doesn't need to be the case, you could meet somebody from a completely different background who has like super similar interests and super similar values. But I think that there is um, something there. Um, and yeah, I, I think that there's... Uh, it is this it's in a lot of ways it's really about in my mind finding people who you can be very comfortable and kind of be your whole self with um so yeah that those are kind of the things on the checklist oh um i'm curious are you super clear in terms of what is important to you in life yeah, because you mentioned that all oh, like whether that person matches how you value like the the value and what is the priorities in life. Are you clear about your own? Yeah, I mean, um, I think when it comes to the important, the top level stuff, I I think I am in terms of um, you know, the most important thing in my opinion is you know I want to spend as much quality time with um my friends and family as I can and. Um, apart from that, I want to, um, make cool stuff with cool people in my work and, um, 
um, get paid a lot more than I deserve so that like uh, when I eventually become a dad, I can just like spend a bunch of time, um, you know, with my kids and uh, not work so hard because I, I figured out that, 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 that money problem early on in life. Uh, so yeah, I mean, high level stuff. I think I'm, uh, I've got some idea of what's important. Got it, got it. I, I, I love that. Don't we all? <laughs> um, and you were talking about how you wanted to be comfortable with this person so that you can be your whole self. Um, so what is, how is Kofi different in a complete Kofi setting than like what the world gets to peek at, like maybe day in, day out and on social media? Um, mm. It's a weird, interesting question because the thing is that I don't think that I am that different in private. Like, I'm definitely, I feel like, I don't know, like, maybe I'm, like, more uh, silly generally than I would, like, portray online. Like, I'm not posting videos of me, um, I don't know, having, like, a dance party in the kitchen on Twitter because it's not relevant to my... <laughs> Not relevant to what people like follow my Twitter account for. Um, I would love to see one. Please do send me yeah, that clip. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm a big fan of cooking, but I I feel like I do too many things now, so I rarely have enough time to do like a two hour cook kitchen dance party type. Uh, thing. Crypto cooking YouTube channel. Let's go. We, we should start that. We have a, we we actually have an idea that we we had back in New York, and we'll talk about yeah. it offline. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I hear that. Um, but I feel like when I think about being comfortable with people, um, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is really just uh, you know um, when you're super comfortable with somebody and you can just you yeah, maybe you just like sitting around not doing anything for three hours. Like, you don't really have anything to talk about. But, you know, you're just hanging out. And the fact that um, uh, the other person is around uh, means that uh, this is this uh, uh, feels great. It's like, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's great that they're in your space, but you're not doing anything. You don't need to perform or, like, entertain anyone or whatever. It's just, uh, yeah, you're just enjoying um, kind of being quiet alone together uh i think comfortable silence is uh is a very valuable thing i'm moving to another tangent but as we know that you're currently like you left the vc job was it like is, is was it being a year already yeah it's almost a year because it was end of last year that i left one confirmation yeah mm, yeah but kind of want to circle back and maybe tell our audience a little bit more, like what made you decide to leave the VC job, which I think a lot of people like in probably want to have like set the food into VC and just to look at how it is. And apparently you decided to leave and you are kind of right now just like contributing to various different projects. What made you decide to leave? Like, yeah, basically a full-time job and right now going sort of independent. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I think that, like I was saying, it was a great job and it was a much better job than I deserved to get, but it was like a compatibility thing because I got that job because of all of the on-chain data science stuff, right? That I was doing and that I was writing about and that I was interested in. Um, but I was working as an investing partner, which is very different from being a, a data scientist. I mean, what my day looks like is, um, yeah, spending the whole day like um, uh, researching um, new new startups and new projects and like having a lot of uh, intro calls and basically having the same conversation again and again and again. Like, hey, nice to meet you. Where are you based? Uh, why did you decide to start working on, on this problem? You know, kind of learning about the team and the product and uh whether or not they had historical context on the market that they were going into and all of that. And, um, and then, you know, kind of collating all the stuff to try and um, pitch deals to Richard and Nick every Monday. Um, and I feel like there are some people 
who would be amazing at that job. Like having 12 calls a day and meeting a bunch of new people and having a bunch of conversations like that all the time. There's some people who would love it. I don't particularly love doing that. I much prefer to just have what um, a top, um, a work life similar to what I have now where I just sit at home and write code all day and most of the time nobody bothers me, right? Um, so I think that before I left, like it had already been, I don't know, a few months, three, four months or something where I was thinking that I would prefer to do something else and maybe I should quit, but I delayed doing that because, um, yeah, it was a great job and there was a great opportunity and there was no real, like reason to, to leave. But, um, yeah, eventually I got around to it and, uh, Richard and Nick were awesome, very understanding, very like flexible in terms of like, oh, if you want to leave now, or if you want to leave in a month or two or whatever you want to do, like being very uh, supportive and, and flexible and everything around that. So, uh, yeah, they were great. Um, but, you know, I think that almost a year in now, I, I think that it was the right choice because I do think that I have have I'm still there's still a lot of stuff that I'm figuring out but the kind of the baseline problem of what do I do every day is kind of solved in the sense of like oh I just do on-chain data stuff I just work on projects and like uh with people that I'm interested in and um yeah that's kind of what my work life is centered around now so it worked out kind of say you wake up you know what you do but when you say on-chain data that is very vague to to me i'm like there's so yeah. many things so have you figured out a pipeline of like how do you f have work feed into you and then how do you manage these different projects yeah you know i should have a pipeline because right now it's a bit of a mess it's um i think that because i didn't know what i was going to do exactly after i left one confirmation like there was a period of time I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll get a full-time data science job. And then there was a period of time I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll um, do like uh, like focus on uh, a product. And I, I, I still don't, don't completely know. So right now there's a very strange mix between I do um, some consulting work. Um, so I work as a data science consultant for Alchemy. And um, I might be starting uh, doing work for uh, SAFE as well, too. I haven't signed anything. Maybe next month, probably. It seems like, yeah. Account of so Alchemy and SAFE, I do uh, contract work for them, which is like a mix of, I can, there's a lot of stuff, right? Because I mean, you know, with large teams, there's like a lot of different uh, things. Like maybe somebody's working on a new product and they want some, data analysis done on like what are other products in this particular how are they doing based on the on-chain data and like what's the trends in that category or somebody's working on some report internally or externally and wants some stats for that or uh somebody wants your opinion on a data product that they're working on um although i do also do like quite a bit of devrel stuff for alchemy as well like just regular devrel things like here's some tutorial on how to integrate some alchemy product into your data pipeline. Um, so I do consulting and then I also write a newsletter about like on-chain data trends. And then I also work on my own projects, like, you know, some Dune dashboards right now I'm working on a, a dashboard site for, uh, you know, about smart contract wallet data. Um, I kind of want to make it like, you, you guys have seen L2 Beat, right? Like kind of like an L2 Beat type website for smart contract wallets um, is a project that I'm working on at the moment. I got this domain, uh, bundlebear.xyz, which I think is a cool domain name. For that. Wait, what is it? Bundlebear. Bundle. Oh, Bundlebear. Okay, got it. Got yeah, it. That's it cute. cute. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a ran there's, it is a very random mix of stuff between the consulting and writing that newsletter and kind of doing my own projects uh, like Bundle Bear. And I'm almost definitely stretched too thin. Like it's not really a good idea. I was just about to yeah, ask. It's not a, it's not a good idea to do three, four different things at the same time. It would be much 
more efficient and like probably more enjoyable to just be all in on one thing. I would not advise that people like do four separate things at the same time. Um, but because I don't have a long-term plan at the moment and I don't really know what the plan is, I'm just doing a lot of stuff because then i uh, like, you know, doing a lot of stuff like we were talking about before, doing a lot of stuff is how you like create luck for yourself and how you gather, gather enough information to know um, what the right choice is. Like if you don't, if you don't know what the right choice is, then you just need to do stuff. And then that gives you the information to then be able to decide what the right choice is. But yeah, right now I'm, uh, I'm doing some collection of all of those things. Oh, and I didn't, and also contributing to DeFi Lama, which is also like a, another thing. So four things, uh, there. Yeah, there's just so many things you are doing all at the same time. I think in a matter of time, uh, maybe I'll ask one last question. So out of all the things that you've explored and things that you've been trying out, what made you the most proud of so far? Um, I mean, it, um, it shifts over time, right? I, I guess it's kind of uh, the answer really just falls to whatever big project I finished most recently. So like right now I'm, I'm really proud of, um, uh, bundle bear, this project that I'm working on because yeah, I had to learn a lot of new stuff for that. And it wasn't entirely clear, like whether or not I would be able to finish, well, not that that project is finished, but at least I finished the first version of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of like every time you pick something new, you don't really know if you're going to be able to do that thing. You just, you know, work at it for three, four months or something like that. And yeah, either works or doesn't work. Um, but yeah, I've got a first version of that done and I've been getting feedback on it, which has been good. And I probably will share it with more people next month. So I'm pretty proud of that at the moment. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that generally I am proud of the fact that, um, I might not know what I'm, I'm doing still, but I feel like I've, I've, uh, I've got a lot of things right in the sense that I work on stuff that I'm interested in with people who I think are really cool. And, um, I've taught myself enough stuff to be able to make things by myself, which I've always thought is pretty important, like in terms of, uh, being able to, yeah, think of a project or think of a thing that I want to do and just be able to make it, um, by myself. And, um, yeah, it will be, it's, I think it's, it's good to like, kind of remember that we've made a lot of progress guys. We should be grateful for that. Yeah, we've come a long way. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's the dream, right? Like doing things you love with people that you enjoy. That's the, I feel like that's one of the ultimate goals in, in, in yeah, life. for sure, for sure. And um, yeah, getting to hang out with you guys and all the other Dune nerds and hang out with the, the llamas at DeFi Llama and work on stuff with the crew at... Um, alchemy and that's safe and wherever else i've helped people out with stuff it's just uh it's been cool it's been cool it's been very lucky um so if people want to learn more about you where should they go um yeah so i mean twitter is the easiest my twitter account is zero x kofi it's k-o-f-i and um yeah i do a lot of different things by post about all of that stuff on twitter so that would be the best place to start is there anything you want to learn from our listeners and how can our listeners help you? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if um, at the moment you are interested in smart contract wallets for whatever reason, uh, check out some of the stuff I'm working on around there. And if you've got feedback for me, give me the feedback. And uh, yeah, that would be the most useful thing right now. Is there like a link that we should check for them to go look? Um, yeah, right now the link is uh, uh, bundlebear.xyz. Even as I'm saying that, I'm thinking that I need to put more, need to put more resources there because if if somebody's like coming in fresh, this might be very. There's a lot of confusing stuff on there. I need to make it more 
beginner friendly. But yeah, check that out uh, and uh, let me know if there's anything that you would want to see or that you think could be better about it. All right, cool. Thank you so much for coming on the pod Thanks today. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Journey of the Unordinary. If you haven't already, please subscribe so you won't miss an episode. You can find us on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you are listening right now. Also, if you know someone who might enjoy the podcast, please share it. If you like our conversation, please help rate it and give us a review so others can discover the podcast and join us on the same adventures. Join us next time as we carry out intimate conversations with our unordinary guests to discover their journeys to where they are today. See you next week.